Easter Sunday, and so we're glad to gather together. This is normally when we dismiss the kids, but sorry, kids, you're staying with us today. Oh, London, second round. <laughs> it's better than the third time. Um, <laughs> trust me. Uh, no, we, I have committed to doing a kid-friendly service, meaning that it will be shorter, I guess. I don't know how to do anything beyond that. Uh, so there was a few people in first service that missed their nap, but that's okay. Uh, because afterwards we do have uh, time to fellowship, and we would invite invite you to do that. Uh, We are continuing our study in the book of Matthew, so if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to uh, to open it and to be looking at Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 41, Easter uh, morning is the the day that the Christians kind of gather together, and we emphasize and celebrate Jesus' resurrection. The term Easter kind of comes from, I think, an old English word, which was associated with kind of the, the pagan holidays from years ago. So some people have said, let's call it Resurrection Sunday instead. I don't really care what you call it. Uh, some groups call it Paschal Weekend because it has to do with the Passover. All that to say Jesus here in Matthew chapter 22 is in Jerusalem celebrating this Passover event. And all the people would come to Jerusalem and they would gather to celebrate how God had saved them out of Egypt. And it's here that Jesus is now teaching in the, in the temple and kind of sharing his ministry, his life with the people of God. And, and so we're, this is where we're at in the story. And, you know, when we celebrate the, the story of Christmas, we are focusing primarily on Jesus' birth, his human birth, that God came and was with us. But when we get to Easter and most of The scripture is really about this last week of Jesus' life, which is the prominent part of the story. We actually see Jesus revealing himself as more than simply born of the Virgin Mary, born as a human, but that he actually has this other nature to it. And so after all of the different religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Herodians, they came and asked Jesus questions. They tried to trap him. They were trying to kind of maneuver around politically politically with Jesus, who was somewhat popular because of his miracles and because of the way he was teaching. Uh, They were kind of in conflict with each other. And so they're gathered here. And in verse 41, it says, while the Pharisees were gathered together. Now, you and I are gathered together this morning, and and maybe you dressed up nicer. Anybody else dress up a little bit nicer today? It's Easter Sunday. Last night, I was picking out my clothes, and my wife said, do you have to wear your preaching jeans? Could you wear something a little nicer for Easter, right? And I did, I see, and so if you are visiting and you're like, wow, that guy looks so put together, don't worry, next week if you come back, we'll be back to my slobby self. So, uh, but we, we kind of dress up, and the Pharisees would have been very dressed up, looking good, but in verse 18 of Matthew 22, it actually tells us that Jesus can see past our nice clothes, past our outward situation, and deal with what's going on inside us. And he says that the Pharisees, where they had this problem inside them that they did not have peace. They were in conflict with Jesus. And, and we're going to kind of explore this a little bit uh, this morning. So the Pharisees are gathered together. They're trying to come against Jesus. And now they've asked all their questions, and Jesus asks them a question. In verse 42, he asked the question, what do you think about the Messiah? More specifically, whose son is the Messiah? And that's the question I want us to just take a few moments to ask this morning. Who is the Messiah? Before we answer that question, it might be a good idea to ask, what is a Messiah? It's not a word that is quite common nowadays. We don't use it very often, uh, particularly not in this context. Uh, We use a, a different term. Sometimes we use the term Jesus Christ, So when we say that Jesus is Jesus' name, like you and I each have a name, my name's Eric, Jesus had a name that people called him as the Son of Man, as a human being, but Christ is the title, which is the same word as Messiah. Now, I don't know if that helps, probably not. What is a Christ? What is a Messiah? Well, I want to illustrate with, uh, well, because it's kid-friendly, I brought a illustration, a picture. So we'll look at the screen for a minute. There it is. There you go. That's as best as kid-friendly as I can do. There's a picture. Um, (laughs) When I was 10 years old, the year was 1987, and I climbed into this truck right here. My dad was a long-haul trucker, 
And I sat down, I've shared some of this story before, but I sat down in that seat next to my dad and we closed the door and we went on a trip. He was a long haul trucker and we went on a trip down to Southern California. I'd never been there before. And so I was riding in that truck with my dad. And when I look back, I don't remember a lot of the details, but I I remember this, that of all the times in my life, I don't know that I've ever experienced peace in that way. It became a little sanctuary for my 10-year-old, this 10-year-old boy to have absolute wonderful peace. And my dad, I just loved listening to the roar of the diesel engine as it whined down the highway. And my dad you know, hitting the gears, and he was just driving this truck, and I didn't know how to drive a semi. If my dad had left, I would have just been toast. I just wouldn't have even been able to see out, and I couldn't read a map. I didn't know where we were going. We were just going to this distant land, and, and there was all kinds of things outside of the truck that I didn't understand. This was the last year of Ronald Reagan. I didn't know anything about trickle-down economics. I didn't know how hard it was to be a trucker in the late 80s and try to own your own rig. I didn't know anything. All I was doing was counting how many VW bugs I could see, and I was tallying them. That's, <laughs> that's the level of my thought. I haven't really moved on beyond that, but that's where I was at 10 years old. And it was a fascinating and wonderful time. In fact, one of the things I remember is we were down in Southern California. It was 70-plus degrees outside. The sun was shining, and people were walking around in sweatshirts. And it blew my mind. I thought, why? I grew up in the Northwest. I was like, why would anybody be wearing a sweatshirt when it's so hot outside, right? I remember we were driving through Nevada, and my dad seemed to know things that I was like, I don't even know how he knows that. He had this kind of ability. So we were at this gas station in Nevada, and this guy came up and was talking to him. He was super excited. He had just hit the jackpot on a slot machine. And he had won what seemed like to me an exorbitant amount of money, probably a couple thousand dollars. But but at that time, I was like, that's crazy amount of money. And he was so happy. And uh, so then my dad had to explain to me slot machines and gambling and Nevada, uh, just in general, this kind of crazy state. And this is what I remember about my dad. He, he, He looked at me. He said, son, he will lose all that money. And this is what I thought. I thought, how does my dad know that? I mean, I believed my dad, but I couldn't figure out how he would know because we didn't even know that guy. Like, how could he know what was going to happen next? I tell you that story because in it, my dad is the Messiah. You see, I, I, I couldn't control anything. I was at utter mercy of my dad's dr- truck driving. I couldn't provide for my, myself. He would buy me Happy Meals, and I was so happy playing with those dumb little toys that I got. And, and I just was at this perfect place of peace. Why? Because there was someone in the driver's seat. There was someone who was taking us where we needed to go. There was somebody that knew all about things like gambling and the weather in Southern California. And he knew what we were doing. And he was my provider. He was my helper. He was the one taking care of me. That's what the Messiah is. Every human being has a Messiah. It's impossible to live without a Messiah. And so when Jesus asked this question, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? He is getting to the very core of human existence. Now, as I got older, I would begin to realize that my dad had some faults, some problems. In fact, he was a great father, but he couldn't actually be my Messiah. This became very clear to me when my dad was diagnosed with a disease, and he began to slow down, and eventually I had to drive him around, and eventually he would die, and we would have to bury my dad. And I realized that he was not able to be my Messiah the one to take care of me. In a lot of ways, that's how the people of Israel looked at David. And this is what they say. They say the son of David, right? We need a king. We need somebody who rule over us, who will defeat our enemies and bring peace to Jerusalem and to the Judean countryside 
and, and kick out our enemies. That's, that's who the son of, that's who the Messiah is. He's the son of David. And Jesus then begins to challenge the way they are thinking about it. And so he says to them, then how is it, here's the follow-up question, if Dave, the son of David is your Messiah, then how is it that for David, who was his Messiah? Why did he look and in Psalm 110 say, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet? Well, before we jump in and answer that question, let's just remember who David was, right? He was the king. He was anointed by God through Samuel to be the king who would follow Saul after God had rejected Saul as the king. And David is most famous before he ever became king. What did he do? He had this famous story about David and Goliath, right? Goliath is this giant, Goliath of Gath. And, and it's one of the first stories that we learn when we begin studying the Bible, when we go to Sunday school. We learn about David and Goliath. Goliath was, for the Philistines, their Messiah. He was their greatest soldier. He was the one who could defeat any other soldier in God's army, in Israel's army. And so they had put their trust in Goliath. And the people of Israel are like, well, who are we going to put our trust in? And so David comes and he goes... Well, I'll fight him. And Saul's like, that's not a great idea. You're not even trained as a soldier. And he's like, well, I killed a bear one time. And, and they're like, well, okay, I guess. And everybody else is too afraid, so they, it falls to David. And he goes up against Goliath. And we kind of know the story, how it plays out. Obviously, David won, or we probably wouldn't still be talking about it today. But I want to show you what David said, similar to what Jesus says. Why does David have this perspective of the Messiah? Notice how David, from before he's even the king, he comes against Goliath. And what does he tell Goliath? Verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17 says that David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And then he finishes in verse 47 by saying that all those who gather around will know at the end of this battle that it is not by the sword and it is not by the spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into your, our hands. David had this deep sense that God was the one who could save them, that God was the one who would provide what God's people needed for their salvation. And so he was very comfortable going in against Goliath. Because what did Goliath represent to all of the people who were lined up on the other side? What was going to happen if I went out to meet Goliath? What was most certain? That I would, I would, be, I would die. I would end up with a javelin in me, probably, before I even knew what was happening. And probably most people, as they watched David go out to meet Goliath, thought that's what's going to happen to him. David was going up against death. But he seemed to have this confidence that God is not the God of the dead, he is the God of the living. That he preserves a people for himself to live. And so in Psalm 110, there's this interesting character. So we know about David and Goliath, but there's this other biblical character that is kind of shrouded in mystery. We don't actually learn about him very much, even in Sunday school. Some of us may have never even heard of him. His name is Melchizedek. He's only mentioned one time in which this guy shows up to Abraham back in the early days of, you know, this is Jesus' great, 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 etc. grandfather, that this guy named Melchizedek comes and, and Abraham pays a tithe to him. He submits to his kingdom. And we don't really know anything about Melchizedek except that his name means the king of the land of peace. He comes from this land that is not anywhere on the earth that anybody knew of, but which represented peace. And Abraham paid homage to him. And here's what David understands in Psalm 110. He says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is this king, but, but David actually calls him a priest which is interesting because there are two groups of people in 
Israel who are anointed. The king is anointed to rule, but the priest is anointed to offer a sacrifice. And so most of what the people in Jerusalem during Jesus' day are concerned with is his rule. Is he a good teacher? Is he, is he telling us good, a good way to live? Will he be able to lead a government to get rid of the bad people? That's his lordship. And Jesus fulfills that. But what he's challenging them is there is something else that I want to deal with, that I'm here in Jerusalem to deal with. And that is the priestly nature of Jesus, that he is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, that, that he, the priest is anointed to, to bring the people together. And this is actually what they're doing during the Passover is to come to the temple and to offer a sacrifice to God on their behalf that God would forgive their sins. It was called an atonement sacrifice. That, and it, it pointed back to the reason they were celebrating Passover, which was what? That God would judge the Egyptians, but for God's people, if they would sacrifice the lamb and place the, the blood over the door, that God's angel of death, their enemy, death, would pass over. And so Jesus comes, and what, does it, what do we actually hear from the prophet John the Baptist, the final prophet, to point us to the Messiah, to God's anointed one? On the day that Jesus is anointed, when he steps into the water to be baptized, baptized and he comes out of the water, it says, heaven opened up, and, and the Holy Spirit ascended on him like a dove, and the presence of the whole Holy Trinity is there. And what does God say about Jesus? This is my son, that he is more than the son of Joseph and Mary. He's more than you and I, just purely human. He is the son of God, that he is able then to be perfect and to atone for our sins, which is why John the Baptist recognizes this is God's sacrifice. This is God's lamb who would take away the sins of the world. And so Jesus plays both the role of Lord, meaning that he is a ruler, but he is also priest. He is able to save people from their sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul puts it this way, the sting of death is sin. Our enemy of death is born out of the fact that we are disobedient, that we sin against God. And the power of sin is found in the law. The power of sin is found in you and I becoming our own Messiah, saving ourselves through our own good works, trying to be a good enough person. And this is the problem that the Pharisees had is they could not come to Jesus because they said, I don't need a Messiah. I can save myself. I'm a priest. I'm the high priest. And they missed that Jesus was there to demonstrate and actually share with them. Look at the scriptures. See how David was saved by understanding that he was not the Messiah. He was not the Savior, but he looked to God, to the one who preexisted him to save him and his people. And so Paul would then say, but thanks be to God. So the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory over death through what? Through our Lord. God is our ruler. Jesus, he was like us human, and yet he was also the Christ, the Messiah, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we come together at Easter, this is what we're celebrating. We're asking this question. Jesus asked the question, who's your Messiah? Who is it that can save you? Who is it that can give you peace in this life and in the life to come? So that death is no longer your enemy. Any more than Goliath having his head removed was an enemy of God's people. Let's close with just looking at the book of Acts chapter 2. After Jesus has been raised from the dead, his disciples all see him and, uh, and they walk with him and Jesus teaches them more about things. And then Jesus ascends into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, and he will rule his people through the presence of his Holy Spirit. He says, go to Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit comes. He will then make this good news real to you. 
And so the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples and they go out into Jerusalem and under the influence of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they proclaim this message. And I just want to read some of Peter's sermon on that day to God's people. He said, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here today. That David was not the Messiah. That my dad was not the Messiah that they are dead and buried, and we know where their tomb is. But, verse 30, he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. That God had promised him salvation. That he promised him a Messiah who would lead. And so that David points us, just as my dad, who could not be my Messiah, did faithfully point me to Christ. Pointed me to the Messiah. He goes on to say, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He is both able to rule over you and to forgive you of your sins. Well, what happened? Well, the people heard this, and it says that they realized that they had treated Jesus badly, that they had rejected him. And so they said, what do we do? What do we do? And Peter replied, repent. Confess your sins before the Lord. Say, God, I need you to be my Messiah. I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me. And be baptized. What is baptism? It's just this outward sign of an inward grace. It's the outward sign that God has washed you clean and has given you his Holy Spirit. So that now you have Christ living in you. He now rules over you. He now saves you. He now forgives you. He now gives you hope so that when you come to the end of your life, it is not the end of your life. Death no longer is your great enemy. It is actually merely the the pathway into eternal life with him. That's the message of Easter. That's the message of the gospel. And he goes on to say that this promise that God has made, that all who come to him, all who ask for his forgiveness, all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become the children of God. And this is for your children and for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord our God will call. That means that that call goes to the entire world, that all who hear the gospel are invited. There is nobody who is outside of that. And so I hope today that we might ask the question, who is our Messiah? Who is the one that gives us peace? Who is the one that secures us, that feeds us, that leads us from this life into the next Sometimes the, the Messiah can be some political figure or it can be some, something else, some other person, a spouse or a group of friends that give us our identity, give us our sense of who we are. Most of us, it just becomes ourselves. We are trying to save ourselves, trying to be good enough to please God. And I would encourage us today to celebrate Easter in this way, that Jesus Christ has conquered death. He rose again, and he's our Messiah, and he will save us, and he gives us peace, and we can live with him. And whatever the outside circumstances are, he kind of becomes our little truck cab that we can sit in, and he drives and feeds us and cares for us and provides even life after death. Let's pray.